we're going to talk about all things applique. So in the next couple weeks, we're going to be covering um, hand applique, traditional needle turn applique. We're going to do a little, which um, I'll show you some examples. Uh, we're, so we're going to, well, I'll, I'll talk, show you examples in a minute. We're going to talk about Hawaiian applique, which is needle turn. We're going to talk about Jerry's own method for needle turn. Uh, we're going to talk about machine applique which is hand guided by sewing machine and we're also going to talk about embroidered machine embroidered applique so we're going to cover just about everything uh, dealing with applique so um, well let's get started let's talk about what some of these types of appliques are okay like we talked about this one this was Madeira applique so and that is this outer border okay when you're talking about machine um, or needle turn applique I have different types this one here this one oh, let me get my books this one was from a book yeah I've got it here and this was actually my very first big applique project why I like applique it's faster than embroidery it's faster than doing it by hand um, you can get a lot of detail. You can get things placed exactly where you want them because you're doing it. It's fun to sit down and, and just sit and relax on the couch. And I have my little sewing kit with me and I sit there and do that by the hour. This one is one of the first projects that I did. And it is traditional when I was learning how to do applique. This is traditional needle turned applique let me get a whole square this is a quilt top that I haven't finished <laughs> I need to it's ready it's ready for quilting but there were all these blocks and this was I really liked it because I learned to do the needle turn tra the traditional way and then I came up later on with reason uh, ways that I liked it better the details are very crisp. Well, I, I also do a lot of uh, paper piecing or foundation piecing, and the details are kind of pixelated. Um, and I can't paint, I can't draw, so but I can applique. <laughs> and I like hand stitching. And what I like about it is that it's soft. I like to do it on garments as well because you, it's soft. It's a, where a machine embroidery can sometimes be bulletproof you know you can wear it as battle armor this is called the hearts and flowers quilt and it's out of print right now it's by kathy k-a-t-h-y d-e-l-a-n-e-y this is the hearts and flowers quilt and the book is out of print but you can still get them on places like um thrift books and a Libris, A-L-I-B-R-I-S, or they're used book stealers. So this is, what I liked about this particular project is that it started with this first block right here, which is very basic. The shapes are not very complicated. The angles are not very sharp, and it helps you to build skills, and then the, book, then the blocks get progressively more difficult with more petals and this I think is the last block here and this was the most complicated of all of them and this is from this book here it is it's called hearts and flowers hand applique from start to finish by Kathy Delaney d-e-l-a-n-e-y and I like I said it, it was printed many years ago but I can you can still get it because I lent mine out and I never got it back so I had to order one again recently because I really like to use this quilt it really uh, this turned out really nice so and it tells you pretty much everything you need to know about hand applique so that's one example of hand needle turned applique hand needle turned applique is the most difficult of all the methods of course the easiest method is do it by a machine embroidery <laughs> let the machine do it okay and let's see where's another one this one is hand applique as well 
This one is one of my for show quilts. There's not there's a lot of things on here. I think you've seen this quilt before. It's called Arabesque, and I forgot the name of the lady who designed it. It was when they used to have Quilt University. I took the classes, and this part is appliqued. This is appliqued. Here you have some shadow trapunto, some embroidery, some crystals, and everything. This one actually won first place at the Hoffman Challenge. Uh, I don't remember when. Let me see. <laughs> Sometimes I've tried to put labels on them, and that way I can remember when I did them, because some of these are a very long time ago. Yeah, July, it's called Arabesque Garden, and it was July 2006. So, this is my only, and I do mean only, hand-quilted piece. I never want to do that again. That is not fun. Here we go. So, yeah, this one was a... A ball of laughs. <laughs> Even this is hand embroidered. Yeah, like, yeah, nope. Here is another one that is... Now, this is a, an insane example of a Hawaiian quilt. <laughs> so, this is a, going to be a show quilt. And this pattern is called Autumn... I think it's Autumn something. <laughs> And it is no longer in print, and it's by Lucian Newman, who is the absolute queen of needle turn. This is traditionally needle turned. It is not a Hawaiian quilt. It is actually of Chinese descent. That's nuts, people. I don't recommend doing this. Uh, what I have to do is it's got some stains because somebody spilled tea on it. So it's got some, so that means it's not show worthy, but I think I'm going to hand paint, just hand tint, you know, like when we talked about tinting fabric with the, uh, with the crayons, I think I'm going to tint some of this with some washes and make it sort of multicolored so nobody knows I really stained it. This is a very complicated pattern and I don't ever, this has taken me 11 years to make this <laughs> and it's not done yet and I'm going to have to hand quilt it. This pattern, I talked to Lucien a couple, about a year or so ago, asking her if I could do it, put, enter it in a show with her permission. She said um, she has withdrawn the pattern from the market because I think she said she sold like 900 patterns, and to her knowledge, mine is the only one that's ever been finished. She hasn't even done it. <laughs> she just drew it. Okay, so uh, another book that I like talking about needle turn. This is Lucien's book. It's called Perfect Hand Applique. When we talk about how to do needle turn, I do refer to her book because she does very, very complex designs. And she is that good. And if you want to look into her, it's called, uh, she's got a website. It's called thimblelady.com. And she's in Australia. I took her class one year, I think it was like 2006 or so, when I went to Houston. To the quilt festival I took a class from her and she was amazing and then I took it two years in a row I took what one was quilting and one was applicated I took two different years then this one was we're going to do a, a segment on Hawaiian quilting and that'll be a separate mini class but these are uh, Lucien's design is sort of a takeoff on on uh, Hawaiian quilting and it's done with fun things like freezer paper a lot of fun <laughs> so Hawaiian quilting is traditional uh, and can be whole cloth and made huge. You can do them any sizes. And this is another amazing quilter. Her name is Margaret Dougherty. And she did this thing called the Little Brown Bird. And these quilts are just, let me see if I can find a picture of one. These are also needle turned. And here is the finished quilt. It's insane, huh? Okay. Other types of quilting. Now we're getting into... This is machine quilting here. Standard machine quilting. And here you can see this is raw edge. Okay. And we're going to prepare the applique pieces a different way for, applique, for needle turn as we do for raw edge applique. This is not my favorite. Why I don't, the only time I like machine applique 
is when machine applique is completely ah here we go this is machine applique this is actually done by embroidery machine and the only time i like raw edge applique is if it is encased in a heavy satin stitch which you can see this is and we will do one whole unit on how to prepare these for satin stitch and how to do these stitches and how to get these tiny little points with a machine machine stitching can also be appliqued with a blanket stitch here this one here is d done with an, uh, an invisible stitch or a, what do you call it I've also called I can't remember the name of it a little tiny blanket stitch using invisible thread and you cannot even see the stitching another way you can have embroidered machine embroidered and this is a quilt that I haven't quilted yet but it's uh this is called the color purple by Jenny Haskins heavy heavy into machine embroidery but this is an applique quilt but this is to show you that you don't necessarily have to have raw edge applique using a satin stitch you can use decorative stitches to finish the edges of it as well now if I'm doing a garment I will do machine applique and I will pick applique, machine applique that's got a satin stitch a raw edge applique like this one here you can see it's raw edge it's simply fused on and then I've just done a running stitch around the outside of it just to hold it on this is fine for wall hangings and table runners but anything that's going to be laundered this method is not a good idea and the reason it isn't because over time these edges are going to ravel so I don't like that and now what you could do in the quilting process you could thread paint it heavily along the edges and that would suffice too this one here okay this is you could do a fusible and blanket stitch along the edge and but I still have you still see the raw edges and I personally don't like that so what I have done here is I have pre-turned it so it's turned its face there's different ways to do that but I have my favorite and I'll be sharing that with you as well okay then oh here's another example this is one I'm working on now which is also handwork and this is using my I called it the electric needle turn but it's not really electric it's it's pre-turned applique which is hand stitched on and you can see the hand stitching on the back and a piece of thread this is called hexes and this is called English paper piecing and it's done with little tiny papers and you fold it over and you sew those together and that's a different class too but uh, this is a work in progress I still have to put the berries and decorate with berries and stuff here on the wreath it's supposed to be for Christmas started it like five years ago it's not done now this is an, this one is also pre-turned applique right here but you can't see it it's pre-turned but it also in the, is incorporated with machine applique so like anytime you have a machine sewing machine embroidered applique that it has an applique piece you can elect not to applique it because what I did was anything that required stitching I stitched on there however it's pre-turned and then I needle then I called it I call it needle turn but it's not really then I just edge stitched it by hand on the back or uh, so that what I like about needle turn or I call it needle turn whether it's pre-done or not is that the applique literally just sits on top of the fabric it's like it's floating there and it you have to look close to see it's sewed down it doesn't look like it <laughs> okay this is one I just finished and I used it last month this here's the lesson make sure you pre-wash everything before you sew it especially red look what it did it bled but this is pre-turned applique but what I like about pre-turned applique 
rather than fused. Fused is kind of flat and it just sits there. This get, has a little bit of dimension to it and it looks like those heart, heart flowers are just literally floating off the, off the fabric. And I really like that technique. Let's talk about preparing your fabric for, like here's my pattern. Here, now this one, I put it together. You have to tape it together, which I already did. Okay. So what I did after I taped it together, I divided into quarters and I marked crosshairs. So anyway, here's my background fabric and it's it called for a five and a half by 13 inch or 12 and a half wide piece. I always make it a little bigger because sometimes applique draws your fabric in a little bit. So I've drawn my crosshairs. Different ways that you can transfer your design to your to your background fabric. You can put your put it on top of a light table, and I'm going to show you how to build your own light table in a minute. At, or put, or hold, tape it to a window while it's sunny, and then trace it. Um, you don't have to if you don't want to trace it to your background fabric. Then you want to get something like a vinyl. I, I don't use this method anymore, but you would draw your design onto your vinyl. Get out of here. Where did my design go? Here it is underneath. You would trace it onto your vinyl. And then you draw your crosshairs. And then every time you want to put a piece in, here, well, we'll just pretend this is a piece. You would pin it to the top and you would slide it underneath so that it matches up just exactly where it goes. That's if you don't want to mark it at all. This also works if you've got a dark piece of background fabric and you can't mark it or if you mark it you can't see it. Although, you know, it's hard, sometimes it's hard to mark dark fabrics because you can't see even through a light box with it. So I will use this if I'm if I'm tracing on black or dark blue, navy blue, brown, any anything really dark. So my favorite way is to draw it on. Now, if I'm going to draw it on, and I do like to use the friction markers. Now the friction markers can sometimes bleach out your fabric. However, I got a tip from So Steady. What they say to do is put on at least two layers of spray starch onto your background fabric, put it on rather heavily, and then press it dry, and then make whatever marks you want because the starch will protect the fabric from bleaching from the pen. I tried it on, usually I have trouble with red and purple with these pens that it'll, and gray, I don't know what it is about gray, but they will bleach out. And I did try it on some red putting a lot of spray starch, and it did not bleach out. I don't guarantee it for all the colors, though, but it seemed to have worked for the moment, so <laughs> for that one. So anyway, what I like to do is you want to get one of these little LED lights, okay? And then you want to get four spools of thread, and I like to use my isocord ones because they're big and tall. Here we go. Okay. Get four spools of thread and one of your square rulers or a ruler that's a little bigger than what you've got. If you've got a big piece, you're going to take some double-sided tape on top of those spools of thread because, scoot them out, okay. Reach, put this underneath. There's your light box, and then here, let me turn that off a minute. So, what I like to do is I like to pit, match up the crosshairs here and pin it into place. Two pins usually will hold it so you can see through it to draw. And just carefully trace it on. And every pattern maker is going to be different. Wherever you see a dotted line, like here, that means something is underneath of it. 
And they usually have numbers like sew this on first, this second, this third, whatever. Okay, I'm going, so I'll just do the umbrella. And usually I will, because if I don't always get it, I will try to draw that just inside the line. Like, that line's pretty thick right here. I'm going to try to draw that just inside of it. That way, if it shows through, I don't care. And you just trace it in. Get your drawing put onto your background fabric and it's nice and easy to do. You have to be careful when you're pressing your pieces on. Whether this be, this is good for if you're doing raw edge applique, if you're doing turned applique, if you're doing machine, in, not embroidery. Embroidery, the machine is going to tell you where to put those pieces. Sometimes they will draw the pieces in reverse. For the individual pieces sometimes you're just going to get the design period just as like in here's from the little brown bird look at how complex those little pieces are and they're not always numbered <laughs> sometimes they are <laughs> so you sometimes you have to sit and look at it and decide what goes first sometimes they'll give it to you and sometimes they don't and it's going to be the same pattern, whether you a pattern, method of putting the pattern on, no matter what method you're using. Here's another book that I like, which is called Mastering Machine Applique by Harriet Hargrave, who's like the godmother of all quilting. See, here's a simple pattern. And here, this one's even telling you which way to stitch it. So you would trace it out and... And it doesn't give you the numbers. Some give you the numbers, some don't. There's another one I forgot to show you here. This one is done by an embroidery machine. And this is incorporating a blanket stitch or an e-stitch, a satin stitch, as well as fill-in embroidery as well. They're fun to do. So, to get the pieces started. Start tracing out your pieces. We're going to assume whether you're doing machine applique or, or the pre-turn needle turn. And I'm going to show you how I do that. My way of doing pre-turning. I'm going to use a rinse away, tear away stabilizer. And what that is, is that's the stabilizer that is actually a tear away, but it has rayon fibers in it so that when you wet it, the fibers dissolve, uh, the, uh, the glues dissolve, leaving the fibers behind, and it lets you, you don't have to take it out. Uh, a lot of times people use freezer paper to draft their designs, but the problem with, a couple of problems with freezer paper, A, you have to take it out. I don't want to take it out. Once I have it sewn in there, I don't want to move it. The other thing is that, um, and it can get lumpy. <laughs> Because it sort of stays together, it, it, you know, little pieces of paper clump inside and get hard. And the other thing is that freezer paper shrinks. Um, if you've ever done applique and you know you traced it out exactly this size and then you go to put it on there and it's too small, that's because freezer paper shrinks. So if you are going to use freezer paper in order to transfer your designs, like if you're going to trace them or whatever, pre-shrink your, your freezer paper. And what you do for that is you get a, one of these, these mist, mist um, things. Or this, is, this is just water now, but it's from Old Best Press. And you're going to put it on a heavy board or you know, a flat board or an ironing board. And you're going to wet your freezer paper and you're going to press it dry. And that's going to shrink your freezer paper by about 1%. I was surprised, but yes, it does shrink. It shrinks enough because when you're trying to match these out, sometimes these little pieces are like a sixteenth of an inch apart. You can't afford for those pieces to shrink up on you. Like these little teeny ones, that'd be a pain in the neck if it shrunk on you. So, and this, this doesn't shrink. And I am going to do a dotted line 
for because that makes me tells me that I'm going to have to put this underneath something else. Okay, then I have another piece. And a dotted line because it's underneath something. And I might even put a dotted line where the other pieces go. Okay. And I've got two more little pieces to do. There's a leaf. further apart. Okay. And let's see, I'll just, I'll number them. 14, this is a 16, a 15, and a 14. Okay. okay and I'm going to cut them out. And I'm going to cut them out right on the line. And I'll just do the, the well, I'll do the complex one first. And this is what I call a turned edged applique, whether it be for machine or for handwork. I'm just going to do this little orange piece. And it helps to have a small iron. Okay, now, I have drawn it this way. This one probably doesn't matter if it's backwards, but other pieces will matter. So I want this to go on that way, which means the right side of my fabric has to be this way, so I am going to put it on so that I glue it with the printed side up. And what I need, I need a piece of scrap. And you got it, Elmer's washable school glue. Best stuff in the whole wide world. <laughs> okay. And I'm just going to, not a whole lot, just enough to sort of hold it on. Don't over glue it because you just, if you're doing hand work, you're going to have to hand, hand turn that, or you know, needle through that. That's not going to be fun. I'm going to put this on so that I have a little bit more, a little less than a quarter of an inch. Okay. And I've turned my iron on. And I'm using this small iron, but you could also use those little small clover irons, the little triangular ones. And I'm going to heat set that down, because now that won't come off, and that's too high. Okay. I'm going to put it aside, because I'm... Okay, I'm going to trim this a scant quarter of an inch. What I like about this is this has got curves, an inside point, and an outside point, which is why this is a good shape to start with. Okay. And then I'm going to clip right in to that corner. It helps to have a pair of scissors that are sharp all the way to the edge. And then we need my scrap piece of paper. Let's see, there's Sometimes they will give you the the uh, pattern in reverse. Sometimes if you have a copy machine, you can reverse it. So sometimes your printers will re reverse it for you, but not always. Okay, so we need our, you got it, Elmer's washable school glue. Okay. And I will usually start at the flattest spot I can get. And I'm just going to put a little bit of glue right along the seam edge. You can also use those Fonz and Porter's glue sticks that are yellow. Um, they, those work very well too, but they're a lot more expensive. And then this this is a real complicated tool that you got to have to search high and low. A flathead screwdriver. Okay, so you're going to start turning it and because I'm turning a corn when it's flat it's easy you just go and you can you've got enough time to reposition it okay and then I'm going to take tiny little pleats and I'm using the edge 
of the screwdriver to put it on the edge and then flip it down. Um, I've been doing this with a screwdriver for years. Uh, I'm sure if you look on the quilting sites, they have these tools called Appliquicks. They're, to me, they're longer than I'm used to. I like holding on to the handle of a screwdriver. Okay. Or mash it down. You can always turn it over if you see any little peaks. Like, see this? There's a tiny little peak. I can work that out while that glue is dry or is wet. I can work that out. And I'm going to put more glue on the edge all the way to this point. Okay. And then I'm going to continue to turn. And like I said, you just turn it up on the edge and then just flip it down and you're just making teeny tiny little pleats. It is, and that one's got a big pleat. Okay. So I do it again. Okay. And then usually and usually I like how that look. If you like how it looks, or especially, oh, there's one, another little peak. And I'm going to work that little peak back. Okay, once I have it like I like it, I'm going to take my little iron here. I'm just going to do some of it, just the corners. Because now that heat sets it down and those won't come out. Okay. Now for this point, to get a really sharp point, I'm going to go all the way to the point. And sometimes it helps to take the edge of that screwdriver and crease it. Just push it in and it makes a crease. Then you're going to take your scissors, because I don't want all this bulk in there, and where it comes, folds in, to where I have cut it, I cut a 45 degree angle, okay? Then I'm going to just apply glue to that point. Because this you want to take your time just to that edge. And I'm going to sort of push, hold, usually put fingernail or another screwdriver to push that in. Then I'm going to turn that so that that folded edge you just did is matched up with this edge, okay? Then you hold this, and if you if you need to, you can use. You hold it down with your seam ripper. So I hold it on with two hands. Oops! You know what? I didn't apply any glue. I'm gonna apply. Do that again because I forgot to put the glue. Okay, it's hard to see that. We need the. Where's the one with the dark purple? There, you'll see the dark purple better. I don't know, they come out of the same package. This is what's what makes me crazy. They're exactly the same. They came out of the same package. One of them is lavender, and the other one's purple. I like the purple one better because I can see it. Okay, now I can see what I'm doing. Okay, again, I'm going to push this point fold here, hold it, and start pushing in over here. When you go to the end, make sure you get it good. And I've got a little peak that I'm going to work out. Okay, once it looks like, you, if it sticks out here a little bit, sometimes I'll take a pin. And I'm going to, I can, this one doesn't need it, but if it sticks, stuck out, just take a pin and slide it on there. And it makes it, then, when you want that all the way to that end, and then you give it a little press. If you're not sure that it's going to stay, heat set it down. Probably not on my table like that, that's not a good idea. Now I'm going to do the inside. Here. And again, I'm going to repeat. So I take my screwdriver, and then that's got a slight curve, and then push until the point, okay? Take your screwdriver, crease your point. Again, I'm going to cut 
from the fold to the inside. Okay. Apply glue. Not this one. This one. What is the purple? Sometimes it helps to have a little washcloth beside you because I do have a tendency to get my hands and everything. Okay, and then I'm going to fold. Usually I'll just fold that over, hold it right here. This is where I get my hands dirty and just fold it over some more. There. And then just took all the I'm wearing all the glue. And then I don't use you don't I don't use a seam ripper, I use my fingernail. I get it nice and gooey. That's okay. It washes off. Okay, and then stuff it down. It looks good from the front. And then I heat set it down. Okay. Well, I gotta clean my iron. <laughs> it's dirty too. Okay, I would have already had this piece would be in. This piece would be in. This piece would be in. Then you take your glue on the inside just a little bit. You don't need it. You just do it on the inside. You just want it to hold it. You don't need it be there forever here. Then you put it in place. And this is where I do, and you can wait and have all your pieces done at one time. Cover up your stitching. And now it's going to stay. You can put all your pieces in. You can still take it out until you're happy with it. Then heat set it down and now it's basted. It's ready for machine. What I like about this as versus the other glues, this is where I use my clover one and it's downstairs because now, see, this isn't going to come off. See, it's stuck on there. It's not coming off. And get all your pieces on. Now it's ready for stitching. Okay, so what I'll be doing during the week is I'll be putting these pieces on and I'll be ready to show you with the hand stitching. And do the same thing for the leaves because I'm going to do this moon sliver. it out and see what a sharp point that is it is a very sharp point and it may turn out a little bit rounded it depends on how much time I want to take to get it and then and how much of a knit noity mood I'm in usually when it's a sharp point I'm going to cut that closer than a quarter of an inch on an inside curve as you're going to clip right up to the stitching but not beyond it and these are not sharp enough and this is usually where I start when I've got like a moon shape so I'm gonna go ahead and go here and insides easy because you just simply push them right up to the point again I'm going to clip okay crease more glue to hold it and sometimes I will give it an extra fold more glue again that's a really sharp point awesome okay and I'll get the rest of this and this once you get used to it, it goes pretty fast I like to do all of my pieces, pre-turn all of my pieces, put them on all pretty much at one time, unless one's got to go underneath, and I'm doing hand work. If it's machine, I just put them all together, put them on. There, that's good enough. I'm not going to go on anymore. Oops. And see this yucky ripple right there? I can fix that. Push it out, get it just so... Heat set it down. Oh, I even like this one. This is this is an awesome point. Okay, you saw how sharp that point is. 
and you look at that isn't that that is really you can't get that any sharper than that and this is why I like pre-turning my applique pieces you can get really tiny pieces you just might get a little bit of glue on your fingers but you know it washes off next week what we will talk about is how to do the hand stitching um, if we have some time we will go into we'll start out with real needle turn the old-fashioned way and then that's to show you how to do the stitches and I call it the hard way of doing things and then we will go and put stitch these because it's the same stitching whether it's needle turned or pre-turned it's still hand applique and it's very quick to do uh, like and it's fun anyway you guys have a great week and I will see you next Thursday see you bye oh wait before I go if you have any questions or you need to contact me I can be reached at waltzquilt at yahoo.com that's w-a-l-t-z-q-u-i-l-t at yahoo.com and don't forget to hit the like button okay bye <laughs>